Hello, Westminster. Uh, my name is Boyd Taylor, and I'm here to uh, talk about the Residents Association's uh, new venture, the Westminster Writer's Journal, and visit with one of our contributors. Uh, the Writer's Journal is a platform uh, for creative expression, whether poetry or nonfiction or memoirs or fiction by Westminster residents and the uh, an inaugural edition uh, will be available uh, around May 11th uh, of this year. So uh, 33 Westminster residents have uh, contributed to the inaugural edition and uh, my guest today is one of them, uh, Ken Ashworth. Hello Ken, uh, how are you and Emily doing? We're doing fine. The, um, the sequestered uh, the situation we're in is very workable. We're both, we both have more to finish in a day than we can get done, which is a good thing to be in when you're a good situation to be in so you don't get bored. We're able to get out and walk around the neighborhood. We've taken up, uh, got a book on identifying trees so we can uh, be uh, <laughs> well great. on our walks. Well, I, I, Kitty and I feel like we're we're really lucky to be here, and uh, we're really fortunate that Westminster has such uh, dedicated uh, staff who uh, really seem uh, their 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 humor is what they're they're in great spirits, or at least they demonstrate that to us. And uh, I think they really uh, really are. Uh, uh, it's a it, it's a great staff to have have here. Um, it's a great place to be. We, have, we, yeah, we consider I, ourselves very fortunate to be here as well. We're satisfied with everything. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So uh, uh, how did you all uh, happen to come to Westminster? Well, we've lived here in Austin in the same zip code for over 20 years, 25 years, and we were I'm 88 now, and we Emily's uh, in her uh, mid 70s. So we decided we needed to start looking around, and uh, uh, we were aware of Westminster, having visited friends here over the years. We put in an application. Two and a half years later, uh, we got a an invitation to begin looking at units, and we found one we were very happy with. Well, that's that's great. That's great. Uh, I uh, I read your biography, uh, Phantom in the Family, the story of your early life and your search for your father. Uh, your mother, uh, I, I I thought from that uh, that book that uh, she must have been a really remarkable woman uh, to have done everything she did during the Depression. Well, she she was and. Uh... Although I wrote the book about tracking down my father, I learned a lot more about my mother and appreciation for what she had gone through and raising four children on her own through the Great Depression, every one of us getting a college education, education being her aspiration for all of us. She moved us here from Lampasas uh, to be sure here I was not even five years old. She uh, had a baby and two boys in between, four of us brought us here to Austin with the aspiration that we'd be able to go to the University of Texas. I did, uh, all of, uh, two, of, two of my brothers went to uh, Nacogdoches, Stephen F. Austin. My sister got a degree from California Institution while she was uh, married to a member of the Air Force. Yeah, yeah. Well, she, people seem to, to want to help her, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, quite a tribute to her because they they saw in her that she she was uh, had that determination and ability to uh, to uh, do what she thought needed to be done. But she did attract a lot of helping hands along the way, and uh, that uh, I think that was a remarkable story too. In the middle of the depression, that people were so, were uh, recognized her and uh, were willing to help her. Yeah, there was, there was no parachute in those days. It, everybody had to make it on their own. And there was a lot of uh, cooperation and, and helping hands um, yeah. that, that uh, helped pull us along. You had a, quite a career, uh, vice chancellor of the UT system and executive vice president 
of UT San Antonio and then commissioner of uh, higher education in the state of Texas. That's quite a journey for a South Austin boy. Yeah. <laughs> and you wrote Phantom in the Family in China, I believe, or at least part of it. Yeah, I, I started doing the research here. <clears throat> what got me interested was uh, when my mother passed away, I found some letters between her and uh, Edgar, Edgar, J. Edgar Hoover about my father. And so that got me kind of interested. She had told me in later life when she thought I was old enough to bear the, bear the burden of uh, this information, she told me my father had broken out of jail in my passage. So I went to Lampasas. I figured in a small town like that, it had to be in the local newspaper. So I found records of it there. And that's what got me interested in, in tracking him down and seeing why he left us with, and why she, he left my mother with uh, pregnant with a, a fourth child of his and uh, deserted her. And so it, the search started there. And then of course, the, one of the most remarkable things was uh, discovering that our name was, that his name was really not Ashworth, that he had taken on several pseudonyms and, uh, um, and also um, that, that uh, well, he, he, was a, he was a reprobate and a, and a liar and a con man and uh, worked his way through uh, his life as best he could, I guess. Uh, he remarried after leaving my mother and we did locate a half brother, um, who was living in Brownsville, Texas. So we managed to get together with him. Um, but as as, I, as you pointed out, I learned more about my mother than my father in uh, researching his background. That's a really fascinating story. And uh, uh, what, what, what was it like in China while you were working on the book? Well, China was a fascinating uh, experience for us. Emily had been working for 20 years at Texas A&M University in charge of international programs when the National Science Foundation offered her an opportunity they, to go to Beijing to represent the um, American NSF office in China. And uh, she uh, asked me if I'd be willing to go. And of course, I jumped at the chance and we went over there. We were there for three years traveled all over China and much of the Far East uh, during that time that we were there. Um, in terms of the book itself, um, I, I was amazed that I was able to do a lot of census research uh, through Ancestry.com um, uh, online over there. And of course, I had, I had information that I was able to uh, obtain here by email and correspondence in this country. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so I, was, I put it all together and started writing while I was over there and finished, pretty well finished up the book uh, while we were in China. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a great, uh, great story. I, I mean, I'd always thought maybe if going to a remote ranch or to a remote island or taking a freighter trip around the world and you could write, but being in Beijing and writing was something that uh, didn't occur to me. I assume that there's a lot of distractions, but uh, you uh, turned out a wonderful book and I really enjoyed reading it. Thank you. Um, so I wanna thank you for contributing to the uh, inaugural edition of the Writer's Journal. Uh, the title of your piece is uh, Coming of Age in the Navy and uh, that really tells it all, doesn't it? <laughs> well, uh, you had a very effective committee um, one of your members, uh, I think she probably preferred to remain unidentified, <laughs> and inveigled me into uh, uh, preparing something for the journal. So uh, at her request, I did, and uh, uh, it may offend a few people. It's got a, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, when it, when you deal with the Navy, it's pretty hard to get away from the profanity. Well, let's say it's realistic. <laughs> <laughs> but you were a musician. What did you? What instruments did you play? Well, I I started playing French horn in uh, junior high school here in Austin. The conductor uh, uh, needed a French horn player, and I was attracted to the trumpet and the clarinet and all those other instruments. But he showed me a French horn, and it, maybe you're familiar with it. It's a beautiful instrument with yeah. with the multiple curves and a nice big bell on it. 
And he showed me that, and I thought, oh, this is what I want to play. I didn't realize he was giving me one of the hardest wind instruments known to man to play. Maybe, maybe the oboe is a little harder, but French horns are very difficult. I decided I was going to be a, a band director, like the one who had inveigled me into, into playing French horn. And I started as a music major at UT. And, and then um, the, G, uh, the Korean War came along, and I realized I might get the GI Bill to pay for my college education. There were no loans or grants uh, in those days. So I joined up and in the Navy I learned, I played trumpet in one of the dance bands as well as French horn. Uh, the trumpet section decided I, I couldn't, I wasn't very good at syncopation, so they suggested <laughs> to take the string bass. So I started playing the bass instrument. Um, I found one in Hong Kong for $25 in a used furniture store and bought it and brought it back to the ship, and brought it home, worked my way through college playing that. Later in life, uh, when I couldn't keep my embouchure up on my French horn, I switched to clarinet. By that time, I'd met Emily, and we played, uh, we could play together a lot. And then she decided, she said one day, you know, when I retire, I'm going to take up cello. And I said, well, if you take it up now, I'll take up violin with you. So the, the two of us took up string instruments and spent a lot of our time in Beijing playing duets in the evenings. So, uh, no one would want to hear us, but we had good time playing. That's and uh, so uh, I've learned to play a lot of instruments. Music's been a big, big part of our lives and uh, continues to be. Yeah, uh, well, that's that's great. Are you still playing? Yeah, I'm playing. I picked up my clarinet uh, recently and my tremor. I have a uh, what's called minor essential tremor. Uh, if the tremor's so bad, I can't keep my fingers over the holes very well on clarinet, so I'm concentrating on violin. And the tremor gives me, a, some people call it an automatic... Uh, vibrato. Vibrato, but I, I, call it, <laughs> I call it a chatter. Uh, anyway, uh, again, nobody wants to hear us, but uh, we have a good time. I don't know, Ken Cook may have, uh, Carol and Ken may have their eye on you for a performance at their, <laughs> at their next... Uh, talent show or, <clears throat> well, uh, I, I, I guess I, I knew, but uh, it came as a little bit of surprise to me that uh, these, the admirals had their own bands. Yes, um, it, it, um, that's been a Navy tradition going back to the Brits uh -huh. um, where an admiral has a small band. Uh, we, were, we were always somewhere between 16 and 18 members. Uh, which gave us enough for a good dance band, but also a, a small band that could we we always miss the work uh, sessions, you know, loading stores or shells or fuel or anything like that. We had to practice. We, we got to we got to a concert uh, play for the uh, crew, and the crew appreciated it. a little bit of background music helps a lot. Yeah, we played in the evenings on the fantail for enter entertainment. Uh, anytime the admiral wanted to do something, we'd uh, we'd go along and and uh, concertize on his behalf. Uh, that's it's so that's 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 great. So you actually wrote a march for one of your admirals, I think. <laughs> well, w wanting to be a music major while I was in the navy, I was studying harmony and instrumentation, and and I was uh, doing writing arrangements for the little band that we had on the ship. And uh, so I tried my hand at uh, composing a few marches. So I wrote one of them that I call March Dauntless, which I uh, dedicated to the Admiral. Uh, his, code, his call name on the radio was Dauntless. Uh -huh. uh, and he loved it. And, uh, and in this uh, little piece that I wrote, uh, I, I pointed out that uh, I had uh, had that recorded by the Long Beach City Band, a band of about 50 or 60 instruments. and. Uh, I had a recording of it, so I had that recorded and sent it to him after he'd been transferred to New Orleans. And uh, he, he wrote, sent me back an autographed copy of his uh, picture and uh, telling me that he played it for his uh, gatherings at his home and impressed everybody that one of his White Hat sailors had written this march for him. Well, that came in handy also later. Uh, I won't we're going to spoil your whole the piece for the for the readers, but uh, <laughs> <Okay>. we'll hold <laughs> that one. <laughs> so, uh, so would you uh, share some of that of your uh, story with our viewers uh, today? 
What, yeah. what are you going to read? Uh, I'll just read a, sh a short excerpt from this. Um, I indicate that I had uh, joined the Navy to get the GI Bill. So I'm, I got through boot camp and I was at the Navy School of Music. So uh, let me just read this uh, excerpt. Uh, okay. Uh, while living in the barracks at the Navy School of Music, I was appointed head of one of the rotating nighttime watch units to guard for fire and security while everyone in the barracks was asleep. As that supernumerary, I became close friends with the older non-commissioned officers who really ran the music school. Although I was probably the weakest French horn player among all the bands, that didn't matter when it came to my assignment upon graduating from the school. My old salt sailor buddies saw to it that I got posted to one of the most coveted assignments in the world, the shore-based band at Naples, Italy. But as I got to thinking about my good fortune, I was not sure my buddies had done me a favor. I had joined the Navy for the sole purpose of getting the GI Bill. And it was possible I might not be eligible if I went to some cushy post in Europe. So I called the Veterans Administration there in Washington and talked to the lady about my dilemma. When I explained how I needed to be absolutely certain I got the GI Bill, she said, there is one way you can be absolutely certain of that, go to Korea. That afternoon, I asked to be reassigned to a band on a ship in Korea. I reasoned that my likelihood of being killed as a musician on a ship was pretty small. The next morning, to my utter embarrassment, I was called out of ranks by the commanding officer of the school. He told the 400 assembled bandsmen how Seaman Kenneth Hayden Ashworth exemplified what the U.S. Navy was looking for. I had turned down an offer to go to Naples, Italy, and volunteered instead to place myself, as he put it, in harm's way in Korea, <laughs> my first lesson in unintended consequences. After the speech, not a single one of my friends called me courageous or brave. They called me absolutely stupid in more colorful language. For giving up my soft assignment, they were right. By the time I reached Long Beach, California to pick up my cruiser, Congress had extended the GI Bill to cover everybody, everywhere, including my friends and my French horn replacement going to Naples. A year later in Yokosuka, Japan, I looked up as an aircraft carrier snugged up next to the deck, uh, next to the dock adjoining our battle-scarred cruiser. The band playing on the deck was full of familiar faces. I went over to visit and found, sure enough, it was the Naples band. When I asked them what had happened, they told me they were on an around the world cruise. <laughs> that's, part of growing, that's part of growing up in the Navy. Unintended consequences. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Ken, so much for uh, sharing that you know, with us. And uh, thank you for uh, being here today. Uh, really appreciate that and appreciate again uh, your contribution to the to the writer's journal well i look forward to, to reading uh all the uh, contents they don't be think, very i think you'll find that they're very uh uh they're very interesting a lot of uh, the, i really have enjoyed all the all the work that's in the journal well appreciate uh, your work in that of the committee thank you well uh, edit, uh, mike roach is the chair of the editorial board and we had uh, a lot of help from a lot of residents but uh, I think people are gonna be pleased with the, with the volume when it gets here. And to all you uh, viewers, uh, the Writer's Journal will be available at the little store somewhere around May 11th. Uh, watch for it and buy it. It's only $15 or $17.50 for the large print version. Uh, buy one, buy several. They're good, make great gifts, you'll be glad you did. And so thanks again to Ken Ashworth for being here today. And thanks to all of you out there for tuning in. Stay safe.